Hey, this is Dr. Drew, and you are listening to This Life with Bob Foy and Dr. Drew. Here we are. Welcome to This Life, hashtag you live, Bobby. Bob Forrest joins me. Also importantly, go to drdrew.com, click on the HydroLite banner. You know these guys, you get 30% off if you purchase with the code DREW18, DREW18 at checkout. And I don't think I have to tell you guys my enthusiasm for this rehydration product. I got a question about that later. All right, we'll get into it. Uh, We all love this product, of course. And then if you want to get some special price on Bergamot, uh, the banner there at drdrew.com will give you a discount as well when you click through. Uh, we are delighted to have these guys back. Uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, cholesterol, high blood pressure, insulin resistance, all very, very good for that. It's a derivative of the bergamot fruit. Uh, share, like us on Facebook, subscribe on your favorite podcast platform, uh, and YouTube as well. Don't forget our YouTube page and your friends with the educational information that we're going to share with you today. And one more thing, check out KBC 790 Midday Live Talk Show, Monday through Friday. Uh, it's now my new co-host, Lauren Savan. She was the object of Mr. Weinstein's affection, if you know who Lauren Savan is. Uh, she's actually a very high-quality journalist and a talent in, in her own right. It's been a great to have her there. We're there 12 to 3 Pacific time on Talk, talk Radio 790 and also KGO in San Francisco. You can tune Everyday Live on the internet at kbc.com. Uh, and we made it simple for you. If you lose, if you missed it, we have the podcast at doctor. dot com. And of course, Mike Catherwood, who was the co host previously with me at uh, KBC, is now over K Rock. You can find him there. And he and I, he and I have a new podcast called Swole Patrol. Yep, subscribe, tell a friend, check that one out. It's about health and fitness. And Mike's crazy on this stuff. Bob, what do you want to ask me about Hydrolyte before we broke my Well, I've, I've just taken to using it like Gatorade. So is that yeah. bad? Because I'm no, just no, putting, it's good. I'm putting <laughs> it in water and just drinking yes, it all yes. day long. No, that's what Susan I feel does. better. Drew. Keep buying it. That's what she does, and I insists. I don't buy it; I steal it from your guys. <laughs> <laughs> but but that's what Susan does. She and I, you know Emily Morris does that too. Yeah, they say that they just like so feeling that. Yeah, it doesn't over no, electrolyte no, no. you or anything. No, as like long that. as you're taking enough fluid water with it. Yeah, yeah, you have to take adequate amounts of water. But no, no, that's good. And with it your helps the water go down faster. With and your now, with now your, now the worst Bob part. I mix a little tablespoon of sugar in my. <laughs> All right. That's All okay. right. That's it's fine. okay. Yeah, yeah, sure. All right. I, I mean, always yeah. like to com- complete c- disclosure. And if you're um, – <laughs> no, and if you're just dis- – you know, if you're disposed – It's amazing. You, it makes you feel younger. I well, don't know what it is. you've I got feel... that liver stuff going yeah. on. That This could affect that. It makes sense to me because liver-kidney communication is a very de- delicate process. And if you're adding some more volume to that, I think that would help it. It's really I – fe- I feel it. So yeah. I just started yeah. using it right, like well Gatorade. Done. Excellent. My, are, you ta- are you taking a, a, any medication too? No. All right. So I was going to say sometimes it can help with certain medication side effects too. All right. So let us bring in, first of all, the brains behind Tech Digital Citizen Academy, dca.org. There Lisa Stroman. Dr. Lisa Stroman is an attorney and a psychologist, uh, an expert in the nefarious environment that our kids are t- spending all their time in on the internet. Lisa, welcome. Thank you. Happy and, to be here. Yes, and also welcoming uh, Dr. Jean Rugala, retired FBI Critical Incidents Response Group expert. Mr. Rugala consults with many corporations and university in developing and implementing procedures and protocols for the prevention of violence in the workplace and schools. Includes threat assessment and management services. Again, uh, hashtag is you live, hashtag share. Obviously, in the aftermath of the tragedy in Florida, we wanted to get into this. Bob, I've not talked to you about this. You, you must be. Yeah, I mean, we talked last two times. I mean, it happens pretty regularly. And yeah, but this was ridiculous. What, what, in Florida, what part? Florida. The amount of kids were killed. Oh, I know. But the Las Vegas thing was crazy. Yeah. Lisa, help me out here. Where do we start? Well, I mean, I'm, I spend a lot of time in the schools, and I get a lot of information from kids directly. Uh, they share me. They sh- share with me their social media posts and things like that. Uh, I think I've been talking to you about this online, offline for a long time about how this is going to get worse um, because I think that we're not addressing the pain that the kids are having. We're not addressing the symptoms um, in every in every case. And, and Gene's an expert in uh, this area, so I'm glad that we have him. Yeah. Um, but the kids themselves uh, are, need help. And I think that the reason why it's happening more and more is because they're going online, they're looking exactly at what others have done, and they're learning from it, and they're doing it better. Gene, do you agree? Yeah, I would agree with that, uh, Dr. Drew. Uh, you know, we saw even in this particular case of uh, the information that was released so far that these uh, he he did research. Others have done research in the past. They look at other shooters. 
or other incidents that have occurred and they try to uh, not make maybe the same mistakes that others may have uh, made in the past. Jeez. They, they want to try to almost, in some cases, it appears that they want to one-up each other. And, and uh, so you're, you are seeing this uh, this type of uh, fascination with weapons that certainly, uh, uh, along with other uh, behaviors and issues, uh, kind of all come together and, and uh, could uh, uh, produce a, a violent result like we've seen in Florida. You know, I, I, there's there's so many different fronts we need to move on, it seems to me, to make this situation better. I don't know if you bobbed the story on this one. So this kid, I had heard some evidence that he was a Russian adoptee. I don't know if that's accurate or not, but I've heard that. Um, very high incidence of fetal alcohol syndrome in those kids. Uh, he has the fig- physical stigmata of fetal alcohol syndrome. Mm-hmm. He then is torturing animals, we hear, uh, which suggests something more than fetal alcohol, like psychopathy in addition. He has an adoptive mom who is all over him, gets him in treatment, is in structured care. She dies of the flu this October. I know. He stops going to treatment, unravels, boom, there we go. So one front for me that I, I'm chanting about is we have to let mental health professionals who have concerning patients get them, bring them to treatment. They need to have some authority to bring them in. This is, this is why we have homeless too. People won't go to care. And I don't understand how we solve that problem. Do you guys do you, have you in your research thought that that the divisiveness and the and the hatred that spewed via the internet in particular is a contributor to these kids? Because one thing we do the know news, is it's media. happening more and more frequently. That's the thing that struck me. It wasn't long between between Vegas and this. It used to be a year. Now it's two months. So, well, and there yeah, and there's been closer. If you look, there, there's been other shoot school shootings that that are, are really going viral. And that's, I think that you're right to point that out because what I see happening from, from the kid level is that even if we're not putting suicides or homicides or we're trying to restrict news feeds to kids as parents, there's no rules about it happening on social media. And so if you're going on YouTube or you're going on to the platforms that these kids are doing, like you know Snapchat, Instagram, and things like that, they are very much sharing this information and I, I think it's a really good point that they're trying to one-up each other like I, I don't understand also this is another front that I'm interested in why we can't hold the platforms accountable for, for at least some of this for at least attempting to be good citizens it, sooner or later they are they're gonna have to be held accountable one of the things I thought is it used to be the six o'clock news all the bad news came for one hour at six o'clock <laughs> now it comes 24 <clears> 7 <throat> every second to well, your Bob, phone Bob, no matter where it's you worse, are it's worse than that if you're in the cable news zone it has to be worse than it actually is to try to attract your eyes yeah. you have to make it seem even worse but so it's it's hysteria on top of whatever the well, bad news is to quote one of your favorites yeah. Ronald Reagan yeah. stop me in my tracks in 1985 i think it was and he made a comment about the media that you're going to hear all these horrible things and and somebody's house burned down and somebody was murdered and somebody was some horrible other things. That's what you're going to hear. Don't forget for that for the most part, 196 million Americans went to work, came home, had dinner with their families, well, and went is... to sleep. And I think our kids are being brainwashed yeah. to think this stuff is happening in everywhere constantly and, and, a majority of the and time. And that is the Steven Pinker, if you've read his Better Angels of Our Nature. Yes. That's his sort of point of view too. But who do you want to answer yeah. that? Rugola, Dr. Rugola, yeah. go ahead, Gene. Yeah, Dr. Drew, if I can answer Yes, please, that. please. Yeah. You know, I think you bring up a good point. There's a, certainly there's an element of fear to this whole issue that's that's important. And and uh, and obviously, when you look at just some of the numbers, uh, these are still these mass shootings, and that's what I'm talking about—the mass shootings, yeah. not individual shootings, yes. but mass shootings. They're still low base rate events, and they don't happen every day. And and uh, they're still uh, the infrequent event. Believe it or not, schools are safe. And uh, while we do, uh, but these events, they get uh, intense media attention. They get intense media scrutiny. Uh, uh, and as a result, you see others that are maybe thinking along the same lines uh, about committing a similar act. All of a sudden, as we've seen just in the last few days, individuals have made threats at other schools. Uh, they've actually interrupted uh, situations where Young people were planning on doing the same thing in their own particular middle or high school. 
So the media does have an influence. Is it is it can it cause somebody who has somebody who has no thinking along these lines at all to commit a type of an act like this? I'd say no. But uh, somebody who is having many of the characteristics that we see with some of these uh, uh, individuals, and as we've seen just what's been released publicly with uh, uh, Mr. Cruz, that, uh, uh, you know, they all, again, all of these come together in totality and uh, ultimately can produce that violent result. But uh, they are uh, still infrequent events, but it's that fear that the, that this 24-7 news coverage, I believe, uh, kind of exacerbates and and, uh, and even now we're starting to see some of the media outlets not even na- not even uh, naming the uh, offender because of the the copycat effect that uh, certainly people are familiar with or have heard about I, I know of no evidence though that not giving their name does anything uh, because they've all everyone's seen the picture it's on the internet I, that, to me that's hubristic on the part of the news outlets well frankly. not to not to alarm everyone but I work with people that have personality disorders addiction problems mental health issues there's a lot a lot a lot a lot a lot of potential shooters in this country and we need to do something about it instead of act like it's this well, single well, hold on, event. Hold on. I've had several clients where I've contacted the parents saying, I'm a little fearful for your safety. Yeah, yeah. That's, again, single shooter, not mass shooter, number one. But number two, in spite of that, it's still kind of rare events. I, I wonder what Gene has to say about this because it, in, in spite of the fact that there's a violent tendency, there's a lot of guns, there's – you know, there's, everything's, everything's very heated up right now. Gene, to your point, it's still rather rare. Right, it is, and and uh, it's still the infrequent event. And, and when you look at uh, even violent crime in the United States, there's been a, a, at least a 15 or 20 year decline in violence in the United States, and it's only been in really in the last two years that uh, we've seen a little bit of an uptick. But believe it or not, we're still at historically low levels. But but try to tell that to somebody who's just lost somebody right. at one of these types of shootings or one of these events. And obviously, they don't care about that. But but when I would lecture around the country, one of the first questions I would ask is, what's people's perception about violence in the United States? Is it increasing, decreasing, or remaining the same? And almost everybody, there are a few that that know the statistics and, and they'll come up with the right answer. But most people, I think, most lay people certainly, uh, would think that uh, violent crimes increasing in the United States when that's not necessarily true. I would be in that category. The thing that shocked me last year, I was doing some research about the opioid crisis, right? Found out that more people die in the United States from drug overdose than from guns. I, oh, yeah. I, I was shocked because oh, I'm uh, so brainwashed by media to believe oh, orders guns, of magnitude. Are, guns are everywhere and guns are the and, enemy. And orders, and, orders of magnitude more than AIDS, orders of magnitude more than car accidents. I mean, it's like ridiculous. It's amazing. Yeah. But, but I was thinking like I knew there was a large amount of opiate overdose, right? 30, 40,000. I thought there was 100,000 oh, guns oh, no, no. because of how we're brainwashed yeah, yeah, about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? It actually was 27,000 I think in 2016, the, one, the year I was looking at so what do we do about all these sick people? That's that's you know that's the main focus well, well, hang that on. everyone I'm... can agree on to get <laughs> mental health is a problem. Yeah. We need to get these people health. You mentioned it. Who? Uh, Gene or Lisa? Gina, uh, Lisa. Gene. And the fact is, who's going to pay for it? Mm. Because mental health care costs a lot of money. Lisa. Well, I mean that's a great question because I think that historically nobody wants to pay for it. If you look at history and how, you know, mental institutions are shut down and it's, it's not, um, it's not an easy question to answer. My opinion is dealing with and talking to the kids who are far more savvy and sophisticated than anybody typically gives them credit for is to have a conversation with them so that we can educate them on what are the signs what are the symptoms? What are the things that you should understand so that you can help a peer and a friend? Because then you would have this horizontal effect where you would have kids looking out for other peer kids and have peer mentors actually getting that those first signs earlier on to adults and people that can get them help. Um, and then and then we've got to deal with it from a healthcare issue of who's going to pay for it, how we're going to cover it. Um, and and I, again, that's not an easy solution um, to answer or to address. I think, uh, but we first have to notice who's in trouble. Yeah, I, I'm just I'm a optimistic 
pessimist. <laughs> so well, I, believe, for, I believe it's easier in this country to get <laughs> gun laws enacted, and we know how hard that is, than it is to get mental health paid for. Oh, sure. So yeah, yeah. we're in a quandary here. If we've got hundreds of thousands of people now, now what qualifies a, a one of these events? Five or more? Is that the cutoff? One because of these events, gun, people. Ask Jean. A mass shooting. Jean, what is a mass shooting? What's the cutoff? What makes it a mass shooting? Is it five or more? No, it, depending on who you talk to, it's it's three three or more. Uh, generally, it's three or more. And and what? Uh, is there a profile in, in, one, of, per, in one incident? Is, do you have yeah. a profile of who is likely to do that sort of thing, Gene? Well, it's not unlike uh, really uh, uh, the young man who committed the act in Florida. We see uh, you know disenfranchised youth. Uh, we see individuals that blame others for their problems, don't we take responsibility for their actions. Yeah, but let me let me so break far that you've down. You described half of the Americans. <laughs> yeah, you, you just described a per- yeah, you, 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 yeah, well, exactly. you described a personality disorder. Yeah. You, so you're talking about a personality disorder uh, and adolescent psychiatric illness. I mean, that's what that is. That's exactly right. Yeah, I would agree with that. And uh, you know, the best prevention's early intervention. I think we all agree with that. And if we can identify these kids at an early stage, uh, we could uh, deal with them from a mental health perspective, certainly within the school system. Uh, you know, a, a more holistic approach, I think, has to be that, taken. Yeah. But, but, let's, but hang on. I, I, yes, because problem, I'll say, a, oh, I agree. Listen, yeah. I had a nephew that, that um, had developmental uh, problems, right? This mainstreaming of people who who are socially ostracized, yeah. can't keep up academically, but yeah. somehow it makes us feel good. In California, I don't know where you guys are, but we're big on mainstreaming people, fetal alcohol syndrome, yeah. uh, uh, right? Yep. It, it just makes for the biggest target for bullying in the school. Mm. We want to think of ourselves as gentle, well, kind but people. But you, you may need to, maybe we need to manage that, you know, the way that happens, you know, what, what, the social sort of consequence and not pretend that they're just magically going to be loved by their peers. You know what I'm saying? Like maybe manage that better. But, but this kid is a, is a prime example of what, uh, Jane, I heard reports. He was talking to himself in class, twiddling his thumbs, but, but, he, but, he, but, but hang on guys. There's a, there's a, this kid is off. there's a model here though, that was working. It was working until his mom died. Guess what? In spite of the guns, in spite of the psychotic symptoms, in spite of the ostracism, there were kids that knew this kid and went, hey, he was a little awkward and weird, but I, you know, I got along with him. And he, he had to go to alternative school, and I kind of wanted to stay with him, but not a big deal. And then when the mom dies, everyone's like, oh, Christ. Oh, my God. This kid's a problem. When the mom now, was alive, he had a, an incident at school with a gun. Y- yes. And it was managed by the school, the health professional, the family. Th- that's what Gene's talking about. If you have an integrated th- presence there – but if, if You're such one, an optimist. But if one part, but it, I'm just telling you empirically, it was working. And if one part of it goes down, they got to have a way to force it back together. You know what I'm saying? There needs to be some teeth where law enforcement can be called and can be able to do something. And those mental health professionals that no longer have the mom bringing him in can go get him. This kind of thing. It's just we don't have laws in place. Lisa, you know what I'm talking about, right? Absolutely, because I mean, just like Bob, you like we've had and. In- people come to us that we know, you know, ha- have you had suicidal thoughts or homicidal thoughts? You know, do you have a plan to kill anyone? Not right now. You know, yeah. there are people that yeah. I've had in front of me and I have absolutely no way to legally and ethically report and get help for that. Here, here's the, here's the simplest way to do it. Simplest way to do it. The Lisa Stroman evaluates the patient. The patient goes, I'm not actively suicidal. I know I, they either, either because they either, ha ha, I know what to say, or I'm really not feeling the way right now, but I don't know. Maybe I will later, but not right now. I don't have any plan. I, I have but, a point. Just so, about that. No, no. But first, let me just say, if we had a law that then was in place that said, Dr. Stroman's opinion was that patient was yes. a danger, that's all, that's all you need to say, and that patient is then brought in, we, the, it's a sea change. It's a sea change. If professional opinions mean something again, that is a new world. It's a My new world. My point is who's going to pay for it. You think it's the ACL, ACLU stopping that. ACLU. I think it's the health Oh, you mean there's not enough right. money? The, no, no, because – Who's going to pay for it? She's going to write a note county. saying – County. No, they're not, Drew. They dump are, new, hang on. Are you saying people I, on the streets They do, night. but are you saying that there's no – that patient would not be held if he needed a held, hold? Often not. No, Often I've they never heard sit of that. in the. Oh, then you're not. You're not. Never seeing heard of them what's not. Going on. Lisa, help me with this. Well, not in Arizona. Well, Arizona's Nirvana. 
Yeah, well, Arizona, we don't have as, as liberal laws where, where everybody gets in. But I think that with Bob's point of, of the funding and where you're going to yeah. hold them, there are laws in place with 72-hour holds. People come up and they argue privacy rights. I have a right yeah. to my freedom and yeah. I have all of these things. But even if you, you, know, if you take it from an in-person level, I have an opinion that this person is a danger to themselves or potentially a danger to somebody else. And we could have a response team. And maybe, Bob, maybe it's not money. Maybe it's a, uh, maybe it's a volunteer team that's, that are first responders, that are mental health or or a law or law, through through it. law enforcement, you know, the trained properly. Law yeah. enforcement. I'm just talking from an LA perspective. I talk to LAPD. They're sick of coming I know. out. No, to places. I know they are. I they know. don't right. want to no, deal with the mental health. They shouldn't problem have in America. to. They shouldn't have to. I agree with that. So so you know, I think unless that, they were trained Lisa, to, and tell want me to. if I'm wrong, but I think when you have, and I've had several hundreds of people who I thought could harm themselves or others in front of me who denied it. I think the attachment within the conversation that they're with you or I or Gene or Drew, they don't have those homicidal, uh, suicidal feelings because they are feeling connected and attached. And I believe the thing that could hap- happen is a back to a, like. You know, we had the Big Brothers program. What about what about something a little more sophisticated for our more vulnerable uh, people with mental health issues like this kid? You're, that, you're really talking about I, – I could not support this idea more. I love it. It's a mutual aid society you're talking about. We, we've been working with many of them, yeah. you and I. It's just you're talking about a new one for – Dr. Drew. Yes, Jane, please. Can, uh, yes. Interrupt please. Uh, or add – just agree with Bob. Uh, you know, it's that it's that lack of connectedness yeah. that these kids need to have. And, uh, you know, if we could kind of integrate them back, you know, into the into the fold, if you will, uh, maybe more the mainstream. It's a it's a way certainly to keep a track of what they're doing, uh, to know what their thinking is. That's really important. Uh, how they view life, how they look at life. And, uh, you know, anybody who seems to be lost and. And, I, and again, this impacts a lot of, I think, as Bob said, uh, a, a lot of kids feel this way, but, but not everybody does what this individual did. Right. So, you know, it's, it's certainly part of that. That's certainly part of the issue. But then you have to look at other uh, uh, influencers. Uh, you know, you mentioned the loss of his mother. We typically would see some type of loss that mm. uh, often is the catalyst that somebody thinking along these lines interesting all of a sudden causes that planning uh, uh, that's uh, that he's uh, put in place to actually go into uh, he seemed to, he's so, in his uh, case his loss of his family he got he moved from school I mean those are losses uh, that we see with students in the workplace it's a loss of a job it's a layoff it's mm. something along those lines mm-hmm. so it could be a death in the family, as we just talked about, and, and uh, divorce. I mean, there's all different types of losses. Most people can handle that. They they do show they are resilient. They can bounce back. But many of these kids that we've seen who ultimately gravitate in this direction, they lack that resiliency. They, they don't have that bounce back. Factor. Let's quickly take a call. We have to take a break yeah. also. But it's not to Josh. Yeah. So my question is, you know, uh, besides the point of being a person that's very familiar with guns, who, you know, has these weapons, uh, a lot of people have probably AR-15s in their house, I would imagine. Uh, But besides the point of this just being very familiar with guns, what's the mentality? And then also, what what actually is the treatment uh, if you're face-to-face with a hypothetical scenario, the next shooter? What's the first thing you try to do other than, say, take away his guns? Well, put him on a hold, I would imagine. Well, go ahead. Been... Let's hear Let's first, Gene. You, you t- there are a couple questions embedded in there. Go ahead, Gene. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, again, not knowing the full circumstances, but I think you'd want to know as much as you can about who this individual is. So, And I think part of that is uh, doing a, a thorough interview, asking him, about, uh, you know, uh, certainly likes and dislikes. Uh, how does he view, what is it, what is it, his or her worldview? Uh, how does he view the world? Is it us against them? Is it, uh, uh, is it, uh, is he easily angered? 
is he uh, slighted uh, if somebody makes an offhanded comment? But, but I think, Gene, it, but behind Josh's question is if you encounter somebody that's about to do this, is there something you can say or do to intervene? Yeah, you, you call the police. Well, no, no. I mean something oh. – he means like you're a little stuck in a room with him well, by a minute. he's got guns. that's what I was going to bring up. There's interesting facts about during the day – he said he wasn't going to school because it was Valentine's Day. The parent, the the people who were allowing him to stay at the house allowed him to stay home. Then he was texting the son who who lived there, mm. right? Yeah. And as if it was a regular everyday thing, right? So he seems to have been going back and forth on whether he was going to do it or not. Uh, he's, he he's, told the he's parents. He's 19. He wasn't in school anymore. Yeah, he was. At that school? No, no, he was out. He was, he was in some school. Okay, he was supposed school, to right. go to school. He was trying to get a GED. Yeah, I see, trying to I get see. his GED. I see. So did, did you read that, Gene, where he was texting with the son of the family he was staying with as if everything was fine? What are you doing later? Right. Like, and, and then planning how to not have to go to school and stay home when no one was home so he could prepare for his, for his you know, whatever. Right. You know, mm-hmm. and... That back and forth, I always feel if some human person came in there or recognized, like, hey, no, don't stay alone and be by yourself. I yeah. always tell my clients that. We leave a 19-year-old distraught kid whose mother just died, who has mental health issues, who has anger issues, a house full of guns, and you just leave. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You're staying home because it's Valentine's yeah, right, Day. Right, You know what I mean? At a certain point, common sense has to return back to American society. You know, I just, I just felt like... Why did why did all those factors play out? Well, so you're, they, I'm, I'm going to ask you're, you're getting into a deeper territory. We won't have time for it today, but we have. And a I'm no, not blaming no, anybody. No, no, no. I'm just saying there's two. We, there are two things. Listen, I, I know what you're talking about. I'm the intervener guy. Yeah, I, know. I go. Listen, like, what's two up things. with you? What's going on? We, we've decided that. Hey, man, whatever you're into, whatever Holy it is. No, no, hold on, hold on. Whatever you're into, and that's the '70s. We're still under that <laughs> umbrella, still, and, and and adolescents know best. Adolescents are the are the are the, the repository of of all that is right. We, we, that's what from the sixties and seventies still is is echoing in the backgrounds, and that's why people don't go. Hey, you're nineteen. You shouldn't be sitting at home alone. I'll give you an example. So if 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 a lot of times nineteen year olds don't want to talk, even at the most functionability, right? They just don't want to talk. You have to say, you know, your mom died. Come on. Yeah. Come on. We need to have a conversation about this. I'm fine. I'm fine. No, you're not. You can't. If you're fine, then there's something wrong with you. Well, that's the part we don't do. You know, somebody needs – we need to be more proactive. In the addiction community, we can. But in mental health, I think we – and especially totally in education, we tiptoe around. I'm telling you, I think that's still the echoes of all that garbage from the middle 20th century. But, but Gene, so is there is there something you can say to somebody if you're, say, locked in a room with them and they have the guns and they're thinking about doing this? And, uh, you know, they, you have no resources to call upon other than your own internal resources. <laughs> Anything you can say or do? Uh, well, again, depending on the circumstance, you know, obviously you'd want to keep a calm demeanor. And uh, you'd want to uh, uh, talk in a very uh, deliberate manner to f- try to find out as much as you could as to what his thinking is. And uh, and then if there's any way, if and depending on the answers that you do get, if there's any way to extricate yourself out of that situation well, sure. by whatever means, uh, and then maybe contact law enforcement. Okay. So but are we? That's a very Lisa, difficult situation. Lisa got locked in a, in a lockdown with a, in a room with a guy like that, right? Yeah, well, I mean, it's, yeah, that's I a did. very difficult situation. Lisa, literally, she was interviewing somebody like that in prison, and the the alarm went off and locked all the the, the steel doors locked came down. All the doors, and oh she was God. stuck with the guy. Oh yeah, losing blood on his arms, um, asking me if I was nervous with an absolutely sociopathic, you know, look at me and that demeanor and demeanor. And I think that what Josh's question is getting at is in that moment, right? We can all talk about it now when we're not in that thread. Yeah. You know, what the, what the sci- you know, there is some research out there that shows, and, and I think, Gene, actually, you may have assigned this to me when I was at the unit back then, <laughs> but, but I followed up, and, and using the person's name, just in right. case they're in this altered state, right, right, to pull them back into a reality. And the other right. thing is, is bringing in um, prayer to God, whether or not they're religious or not. Hmm. I don't know why that helps. For but, yourself um, or for them or for both? Just saying, you know, I'm going to pray to God that that we're all safe and that we're like, the more you can bring that in. I don't That's know what, why the science, but but there is some research on using the person's name directly, keeping calm and, and 
bringing in some sort yeah, of somehow um, that makes sense. higher power, right? Yeah, fantastic. And, I and, love and that. I think you, and I think you have, you want him to view you as a, as a human being. So you want to yes. humanize, yes. humanize, talk with your. So kid. you know, that's what I found uh, crazy. We're getting bits and pieces of information about the kid, but but what law enforcement said is he's very remorseful right now. Uh, his attorney said that. I think his attorney said that. Lisa, which was it? Well, I mean, that's exactly, I mean. The attorney, the attorney has pro- to, yeah. The attorney, the attorney probably said that. And I don't, yeah, you know, here's sorry. the thing. Like Can- I've worked on a, on a psych ward. I've worked on a criminal psych ward. Um, oftentimes when they get stabilized. So let's assume he yes. may have been on medications. Yeah. Let's assume that now he's getting treatment again. You know, I've had a kid who stabbed someone with a Bic pen. Yep. 42 times and killed a security officer and when he became competent again absolutely felt like he couldn't live with himself because he couldn't believe what he had done this is my constant refrain which is if we force people to get proper care they look back at what you allowed them to sink into and go who let this happen to me you should be disgusted with yourself ashamed of yourself letting sick people get so I sick they end on the streets or they harm some well, of themselves somebody else the kid in colorado that did the the movie theater shooting yeah. he was obviously schizophrenic or yeah. schizoid and, schizophrenic and and when he was stabilized he had remorse you sure. exactly what you're describing so the question is what do we do with the people that that are walking around in our society who are mentally ill, unstable, psychotic, what, what do we do with them? Now, this kid didn't present that dramatically. Here in Los Angeles, there was a schizophrenic guy who hung out near my house at a street corner, and sometimes he'd have his pants down, he'd mm-hmm. pee and poo in the street, mm-hmm. he'd scream and yell, he'd talk, you know, talk to himself walking through cars, right? Yeah. Uh, I talked to the cops about it. Uh, he was sta- he was arrested and put into a hold a couple times you over a period what to of do? time. No, but what happened was he ended up. He's the one who tried to kill the CSI girl. Sure, right. And now he's getting the help that he needs. Right, because in prison. Because that's how we do things around <laughs> but, but here. But here's the deal: <laughs> that we now have long-acting antipsychotics injectables that you can give people if we have some sort of w- will to do so. They won't take it because they're sick and they don't like it. They don't think they have a problem. Long-acting antipsychotic. Expensive. Expensive. I worry about the price. But that will get people off the streets. That will get people into housing, into ongoing care. That's all we have to do. But you can't do that if somebody doesn't want it. That's the law. Yeah, we have calls. I'm going to get you guys. Uh, take a little break. Be right back. Friends of Bergamot are back. It's, a, of course, a brand that's made an impact on us here. It makes a variety of supplements. It could, they use the extract of the bergamot citrus fruit. It's full of polyphenols. It's a supplement that acts as a natural statin and may improve a number of cardiovascular conditions and fatty liver disease, as well as potentially high blood pressure and other things associated with the metabolic syndrome. Now the makers are bringing you a formulation called Bergamot Sport that provides all the same cardiovascular benefits, but with some additives designed to aid athletes and those with an active lifestyle. Bergamot Sport may help improve stamina as well as reduce recovery time and muscle inflammation. In an ongoing study, professional soccer players were asked to use Bergamot Sport, and the documented improvements have been impressive. I use the product. First Lady of Love uses the product, the Bergamot Femme. Physicians and cardiologists around the world are recommending it. And for a limited time, our listeners can save 10% on their order by entering the code DRDREW at checkout. That's Dr. Drew at checkout, all one word. To try Bergamot Sport for yourself, visit bergamet.com. That is B-E-R-G-A-M-E-T.com. Or also, you can click on the Bergamet banner at drdrew.com. Of course, we are back. We are pleased to be joined by Digital Citizen Academy, DCA.org, Lisa Stroman, attorney, psychologist, FBI scholar, um, and also Gene Rugala. He's, he's a retired FBI critical incident response group expert. And, Bob, you brought up the, uh, the uh, Colorado incident. The, the details, I, my understanding, are not out yet on that, but he, they had a threat assessment. After, after um, Virginia Tech, all these universities had to come up with a threat assessment team. I am convinced that threat assessment team interfered with the psychiatrist who was taking care of that kid that shot up the theater. They're, they became they, – they adopt an ideology. Well, you can't tell that kid what to do. He's just a crazy – he's just a free-thinking young man. What are you going to do with him? The psychiatrist is like, no, something's wrong. Something wrong. Something's going to go bad. Oh, how, come, let him be. That happens. Gene, is, are you have any, you have any in details on what happened there in Denver? Well, the, um, other than the fact that uh – I think, again, a lot of people knew some of the issues that he was dealing with. They did have a, uh, a threat uh, assessment team See? at, uh, I think, the uh, 
at the university. The college yes, they did. Uh, at. And, you, uh, and that's, and I think there's some litigation that's pending on that as a result of either what they did or what they didn't do as far as alerting authorities that they were dealing with somebody who had the poten- potential. To so, so again, uh, ideology, hey man, just a crazy kid. You can't tell him, but ideology is killing us. Well, to it's not killing mandate. Us. The, and what was, so he went off his meds, right? I mean, that was basically. He was just, he was, he really had just been diagnosed. It was just the process of coming on. I don't know if you ever got at the right meds. He wasn't stable and then became unstable? He, my, as I read it, again, I don't know the details, but he was sinking into severe schizophrenia, was referred for treatment, but the psychiatrist couldn't get him in, get him to do what he needed to do, and he got worse. The threat assessment evaluated him. Guess what? Ideology kicks in. I bet. I don't know, but I'm going to bet that's what happened. Was he just told to go back to school and... Hey, man, what? quirky kid. Yeah. Who are you to say? Hey, yeah. Mr. Psychiatrist. You know, it's like, okay. All right. We don't know. We do know. That's the problem. Again, back to my thing that I said earlier, if Dr. Stroman could just say, that's my opinion, he needs to take the meds, and that's it, or something bad could happen if he's not on a hold, and that's enough, that should be enough. But it's not even anywhere near what we do today. So if you guys were in charge, how would you, where would you proceed? How would we go about, if we had unlimited amount of money to spend to, to solve this problem, Gene, Gene first, and then Lisa. Lisa's smiling, so there must be a big answer there. <laughs> <laughs> so, Gene, go ahead. Yeah, I'll have a short answer. Well, okay. like I said, it, it, it would take – it's it's not one it's not uh, one person's problem. So it's not a lot, just a law enforcement issue. It's a, it's a societal issue. Families. And then if you drill down further, it's certainly a community issue. So, yeah. you know, it, it, it really does take a village if you want to use that, uh, that term. Uh, but uh, – you know, I mean, you really need that uh, a multidisciplinary approach. I mean, you need mental health, you need law enforcement, you need school officials, you see, need to, uh, to, social services, to, to, uh, you know, all working together, all on the same page, all communicating with each other. And oftentimes that doesn't happen just as it appears there might have been uh, an issue as it relates to this case with the FBI. Communication really is the key. And and uh, I can't tell you how many times I've seen that uh, where problems result as as a uh, as a, because of a breakdown in that type of communication. So you need all of these groups working together holistically, focusing on getting that individual the the, the attention he or she needs, and and kind of uh, moving that person uh, off that pathway to violence. We do see that there is a pathway to violence, and that's certainly when we. Look at back at what this young man did. Uh, I think we're going to see that. We can see certainly uh, a lot of it right now, uh, but just based upon news reports. And uh, but you want to nudge that person off that path and and get him uh, the help that he needs, so he doesn't uh, proceed in that direction. Right, see, I see homelessness and violence as the same phenomenon. It, it's coming from the same source, same problem. And as Gene said, community and family and stuff. There are plenty of people with schizophrenic relatives, and they take care of them. If they but they they retain them in their households and whatever they have to do to keep you know keep them on their medication and keep watching over them and keep them mm-hmm. housed and if you don't have a family that can do that then and then no will to get them proper care and no resources that's it now you get homeless Lisa what what's your some of the things you would say that could help I mean I think everything that Gene said is correct. I think that we need that holistic approach and what you you guys have been talking about. The one thing that I don't hear people saying and this is again my bias in some respects is we have to empower the kids to know. We talk to our kids. We're not trusting them to be able to tell them, yeah. you know, this person might look tricky or this person looks different. You know, everybody's being so politically correct today and they're trying to be really careful if you've got somebody acting odd or you act acting differently you know, we're, we're so good at telling our kids to be accommodating and, and welcoming Accepting, and all those things, which yeah. I don't disagree with. But the, the Internet, how these kids communicate online, we have to talk about that being basically a hyperdrive and an accelerator for these kids that are disenfranchised. And we have to, as the adults in the room, recognize we are not often the first people that notice the signs. So if we don't yep. include them in this... We're not going to get anywhere. Well, they, well the, the point that I – so I wrote a song about 20 years ago. It was called Open Letter to Kip Kinkle, right? 
Kip Kinkle was one of the first school shooters right. in Oregon. School shooters. And I, I, I was fascinated by the case. I was newly sober. I read everything I could about it. And what I realized is he had the same school experience as I did and some of the same life things happen as I did. My father died in early age. I was picked on at school. I was a nerd. I was this. I wore glasses. I had pimples. People didn't like me. But but in my day, that built, and, it, and this happened to hundreds of musicians that I w- later worked with, it drove us to succeed, not to kill our classmates. Every musician I know from Flea from the Red Hot Chili Peppers, Scott Weiland, Axl Rose, were picked on in school, that were all of that same generation, and we used it as fuel to succeed and, and show those people. Right, and then luckily enough, it, that with that drive and determination, then you have enough money to get mental health issues. You think it's heroin <laughs> <didn't> mix in? <laughs> okay, but but I, somehow we've changed that. How you how you get even is through gun violence, hmm. and I don't well, know how that shifted over a forty year period of time. Well, that, that's what they're watching. That's what these kids are seeing. And I think, um, Gina, you may have written it or something about the Columbine effect. You know, there are a lot of kids that look up and say, how do I become famous? It used to be even five years ago, they said, I want to be a rock star. I want to be a football player, basketball player. That's what these kids in sixth, seventh grade were saying. Now they're saying they want to be a YouTuber or they want to be famous online. And so that, that notoriety really easy if you're disenfranchised and you don't have anybody that's supporting you, that community, those parents, that, those administrators, um, because we can't trust ordinary kids to be able to come in and say, we're going to get you help if we, don't, if we don't approach it that way and train everybody holistically to do it. But that's why I think they're doing it. They don't, it, it's harder to be a rock star than mm-hmm. it is to go in and be a school shooter. So Yes. That, that's easy to become famous. On. Jane? Yeah, just to add to what Lisa said, uh, yeah, if I can't be famous, I'll be infamous. Mm. And uh, so that's, we've that's seen that uh, a number of uh, individuals have said that. That's so, where we're at. Uh, over the years. So we've and, gone. Uh, <laughs> you know, that this, this is a way to gain that notoriety and fame because a lot of these kids are, I would, you know, at, you know, would loosely term it losers in life, so to speak. And, that was They've me. got a lot of things going <laughs> against them. They're not well liked. They're not the popular kid in school. They're they're uh, disenfranchised. They're isolated. They're they stay to themselves. They may have other friends, maybe that think along the same lines that they do. But uh, you know, they're, they're they've experienced a lot of uh, troubling issues uh, during the course of their life. And again, there are a lot of kids that experience these same issues, yet they don't do anything. So a lot of it may come back to how resilient you are as a person, how supported you are at home. Right. Uh, you know, uh, a lot of it may be uh, internal fortitude as to why uh, someone becomes uh, commits an act like this versus somebody who doesn't. And, and that's always the sixty-four thousand dollars question. Yeah, certainly, yeah. Or, or just how how severe are the psycho? How severe are the psycho? There are more severe psychopathologies. Yeah. Um, this kid had a list. You know, yeah. But the, be, that psychopathology doesn't lead to homicide. No, I'm, I I'm saying Kurt Cobain might have had the same psychopathology. Not right? quite, but yeah, but I he get was, what you He was not even the same as our friends here now. Yeah, right? most psychopaths aren't in prison, right? So right. Uh, That's right. they're out in society. And, and for some reason, it was much more self-medicating, yeah. self-motivating, and now it's, yeah, I, I you know, right. getting let's, to, let's, the, we have, to the Virginia Tech this person. One, we have callers really wanted to get in here, so let's do that. This is uh, Larry. Go ahead, Larry. Hi. My question is, um, going back to Columbine, we have these shooters that people say that they're bullied at school, and schools just say, oh, it'll go away. They kind of ignore the situation. When are schools and parents of these bullies going to stand up and do something about their kids? The bullies. Okay, what are we, we going to do? Yeah. In this latest shooter, the kid said he was bullied at school. I'm not saying that that's an excuse well, for what he, he did. The problem, is, the problem is you're going to find when, they're, when, they, when they mainstream some of these kids that are severely, have severe psychopathology, the bullies are going to be your kids. Not some, not some big fat kid or some muscular kid or some, some kid that's been beating up on other kids. It's going to be just your average kid 
that's going to be and, identified as a bully. And this has happened. I have two small kids. And do, do, and do you understand what I'm saying? Does everyone get the point yeah, I'm making? I think they do. And I, I think they understand that. I don't think people get it. They're going to say that I'm going to, I'm accusing people that all kids are bullies or that your kids going. To, what I'm saying, if you put a certain situation together, any kid can become what what the other child perceives as a bully. I just have experienced it with Elvis. Even though recently. it might not be something you even notice as bullying, if you were to observe it, the the kid with who is who's who's tender, who's in, in trouble, will experience things that might be very incidental as severe bullying. That's just the way that goes. Well, Lisa that, that Lisa, sure. am I am I wrong, Lisa, on this? No, you're absolutely right. And I and that's the biggest shock to many parents is that and this goes back to how do we educate and empower the kids to recognize that people are different? People um, might not look the same. Bob, you said that you know you had pimples and you were a nerd and all those things. How do we teach kids how to have compassion and kindness? Well, not just compassion and kindness, but also the, to the, at the level where what is normal sort of adolescent uh, – what do you call it? Vitriol. I think, yeah, <laughs> right. would I think, be I think, perceived severely by kids who were who were uh, in trouble. But if we're going to teach uh, the empathy to teenagers, that's impossible. I'm talking about. I have a six year old. I have a six year old who felt uncomfortable with a classmate because the kid had uh, metal braces on his legs. And this led to some of what you're talking about, Lisa, a little political correctness. No one wanted to talk about it. (laughs) And so I just addressed it with the parent, and I said, let's get them together and play, and then let's figure out how Elvis can learn about it, understand what it is, touch it, feel it. If you do that with at, at the pre-K and kindergarten and first and second and third grade, you're not going to have to teach empathy to 13-year-olds because that's going to be impossible. You may, though, Bob, Bob because the, the, you know, you, he may be comfortable around the steel braces but not, uncomf- not comfortable around the, you know, the kid with the fetal alcohol or whatever. But so. and, and, you know, and I, I don't know if I, 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 I agree that it's going to be harder. But, but when I walk into a middle school or a high school and I ask how many kids are either self-harming, know someone who's self-harming, or have suicidal thoughts, Every hand. I have about 75 to 80 percent of the kids raise their hand nowadays. Think about that. And then, and then she goes, wait, wait. And they, then she goes into the parents group and goes, how many, you know, what, what do you ask? How many believe your kids? How many, how many would, would suspect? And I might get three or four hands up out of 900. 80 percent of the kids and less than 1 percent of the parents, Bob. Yeah. Think it's about a that. Disconnect. I know. Think about. I'm that. living it. I watch it every day. <laughs> wait, the producer wants to say something. Okay, so wait, wait. She needs a mic. I had, I had three 18 year olds, and I remember high school being really tough on these kids, and the ones that were sensitive, yeah. did feel bullied yeah. and felt ostracized, and yep. they felt they felt like they were alone. They couldn't wait to graduate, and they were angry, just mm-hmm. so angry. Meaning one of my kids, but it. And I could see how some of them would isolate and separate, and they, you know, they weren't going to go buy a gun, but it is an emotion even at that age. Mm-hmm. You, you know, you might think it happens twelve, fourteen, you know. No, no, 17, it happens seventeen. But eighteen is sure. like a really tough age. Oh, absolutely, and and it, and some of it's again, it's it's complex. It's not like this simple thing. We we you know we we think of bullying the way like it's portrayed in a Popeye cartoon. That's or not the way it works. On Simpsons. Yeah, you know, the, the Simpsons, Simpsons or something. Kid. Yeah, the Simpsons And the kid, kid who bullies is always comes from a broken home and yeah, the wrong yeah. side of the track. Yeah, yeah. It's That's much the more cartoon complex. that we've been told our whole lives. And it's our kids that are bullying. Well, and, I mean, well, and frankly, it's an acceptable mode of communication nowadays. I mean, Drew, you talk all the time about people, and you and I talk about these people online that are bullying. You oh, know, that they'll, they, they don't agree with your opinion, and so they, they jump on and they and they flood your inbox with their comments and their feelings tearing you down. Yeah, that's right? more than bullying. That, that's actual violence, I think. It's mob violence, but uh, that's, you know, that's where we're going. So don't expect our kids to reflect something different than what we're up to, that's for sure. Right. And uh, but, but Jean, if I can add, uh, schools today, the, most school districts have some type of anti-bullying programs. Yeah, I know that's true. In, cl- in place, how effective they are, it depends. But uh, certainly, they're making inroads to try to to get the word out. And again, it's while bullying is an issue, there's no doubt about it. And uh, because if you don't deal with the bullies at an early stage, while they're Young people, those same bullies, if they're not arrested or put in jail or, or uh, something else happens down the road, they're going to become the bullies that we're going to deal with as adults and in the workplace or elsewhere. So, uh, you know, so but it's also it's the people that bite that look and watch the bullying that's important, too. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. 
You're, that's right. a, you're, there's, there, when, when something that's it, Gene is making a really important point. Think about this. They don't stand up for righteousness. I well, there, there's several relationships. There's the bully and the object of the bullying, but there's the person who watches the bullying, the person bystander, who may be yeah. the bystander. The bystander may participate in the bullying, may stand up to the bully. I mean, there's different relationships potentially in every dy- dynamic amongst the kids, not just between the two. I don't two. think there's a lot of standing up to the bully going on in our I, adult I, culture nor in You know our what? Children's when when I've seen this studied, I'm impressed by how often there's somebody in there that will stand up. They have that TV show, you know, where the guy, they pose these horrible things. Oh, yeah. What would you do? What would, what you, would do? you do? <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Let's <laughs> not, take a, let's, not, let's, not too many people standing up for truth, justice in the American way. Let's get another, oof, Mr. Oh. Hi, Lauren. What's up? Oh, hi, Dr. Chu. What was that? What? She said, oh, hi, Dr. Chu. I said, hi. Hey, Lauren, what's, what can we do for you? I don't know. I just wanted to call and say hi. Okay, well, we're thinking of you. Thanks for calling, Lauren. We appreciate that. That's nice. See? Pleasant, yeah. Pleasantries. That's enough. That's fine. <laughs> That's fine. Let's stay, on the, stay on the positive side, everybody. We're fine hey, with that. Hey, Lisa, have you heard of this thing where a little girl developed an app for the ostracized kids who don't have kids to eat lunch with? I think it's in elementary school or maybe middle school. There's a little girl came up with an app. Hey, nobody wants to sit and eat with me. It's called Come and Eat With Me or something. Have you right, heard like about a lunch that? lunch scheduler app. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a little uh, girl thought of it. Of course. Not yeah. a man. Not a, <laughs> not a government <laughs> policy. <laughs> right. Not a government point policy, about yes. getting kids involved because I think that they have a lot of solutions. I just got mm-hmm. two dozen letters from kids that said, thank you for giving me a voice. And here's some things that I think are great ideas. So, mm. you know, I listen to them and, and some of them come up with the most amazing ideas on how to help themselves and how to get outreach into their schools and the way that they need it. Um, so, so I, I think that that's fantastic, and I think more kids need to focus on those things. Um, what to help is each the other. name of that app so we can tell our listeners? I'd I'd love for people to know. Yeah, like, let me look it up because somebody sent it to me. I think last week. There's hey, also a yeah, horrible no, thing yeah, when no you're the parent of a kid being no one eats bullied, alone. No one eats alone. Right. No one like eats that. alone. Something app. like that. But, so when you're a parent of a kid being bullied, it's there's a lot of emotions oh, that yeah. go into oh. that, and. Most decisions you make based on those emotions aren't the best. Yeah, it's like right? codependency. So, yeah. so if there's a direction for parents of kids who are being bullied to to because the school districts aren't going to do anything. I'm sorry, am I the only pessimist here? This I have no faith that LA Unified School District is going to affect the bullying problem in Los Angeles. Mm. But I do think the schools and the teachers and the administrators of each individual schools and the parents and the kids can make a difference. But I don't think a LA Unified School District policy about bullying, zero tolerance for bullying, is effective at all. Of course. Right? But this girl's app, I thought, was so fabulous. You guys, we got to kind of wrap things up. But, Gene, before we do, um, is, is it, did we cover the terrain? Is there other things we should be thinking about, knowing about, looking into, uh, maybe places you can send Well, people? you know, I think the big thing, too, and I think we kind of touched on this, uh, is, you know, when you look at these types of cases – uh, there's a lot of behavior that uh, would leak, and we call that we call it leakage. Yeah. So, many of these individuals who are thinking along these lines, they leak behavior. They'll talk to others. Yeah. They'll post on social media. Uh, they'll make comments, inadvertent comments that might suggest that there's some at least a problem. At the very least, would prompt a conversation with that young person. And uh, so, I think we have to be cognizant of that. I think Lisa is right on as far as getting kids involved because uh, they are the eyes and ears and they have to become stakeholders in their own uh, safety and security. Uh, law enforcement is not going to be there uh, 24-7, but the kids are. They know exactly what's happening at the school. Yeah. And, it's, and it's really up to them, just like it is for adults, that uh, you know we have to take some responsibility for our own, our own safety and and it takes a lot for an individual, whether it's a child or an adult, to actually come forward and report something against somebody else. And and I think we have to continue to create an environment within the schools that would allow kids to feel comfortable doing that. And uh, and again, that's a never never ending battle, and that's something that we have to continually strive to do. And Lisa, dcakids.org, they can get information like that? Absolutely, yep. Absolutely, DCA and Kids. Anywhere else you guys want to send people for more information about the material we've been discussing today? 
No, I mean, I think that if, if um, Bob's point is, is well taken in terms of the school districts being overwhelmed but, um, and, and being able to come up with solutions, but as, a, as someone in the weeds with it, I still encourage parents and school um, officials, whether it's the teachers or the administrators, to communicate and talk to each other um, because if you're if you don't know if you what the policy is or if they have a program in place, um, it's it's not going to help anyone. So, um, reaching out to where your kids are, whether it's a after school program or a school, important to understand what policies there are and what help they may have for them. All right, guys, and, and if I can add to that, let me, that uh, it's I think it's been shown that the most effective schools are when parents get involved. Right. Of course. And if they're involved, then the school is, is going to be accountable, and they'll listen. And I think that's important. That is Dr. Mr. Gene Rugala, retired FBI critical incident response group expert, and Lisa Stroman. You can follow Lisa at, at Dr. Lisa Stroman, S-T-R-O-H-M-A-N. And uh, find us on Twitter and Facebook at Dr. Drew, at First Lady of Love for Susan, at Rehab Bob Forrest. This at RehabBob.com. RehabBob.com at This Life Podcast, hashtag you live. Uh, again, go to Doctor.com, support the show by clicking the Amazon banner. I'll do all your shopping needs. Uh, you pay nothing extra, but it helps us stay around. Also, This Life also loves hearing from you, so we will read your questions on every podcast. So go to Doctor.com slash contact and send us your questions. Like us on Facebook, support our sponsors. We appreciate it. And uh, there are some other fine podcasts to check out also at drdrew.com. We have a new health and fitness show called Swole Patrol with Mike Catherwood. Also, the Midday Live show with Lauren Savant, uh, the Adam and Drew podcast, my original Dr. Drew podcast at, from Podcast One. And um, check our YouTube, our Facebook, and there was something else I want to tell them to do. That, that uh, Oh, yeah, we get this opiate. We, we are writing the definitive oh, story yeah. of the opiates. Uh, are, you tr- are you dripping it? Yeah, we're, yeah, we're dripping okay. it in. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah. We, but but we're start, we started literally prehistory. Literally prehistory, and then are bringing it up to the current U.S. problem and how we got here in detail. Bob, we're going through all the laws, so fascinating all the that you're all doing the societies, that. all the mental, the pain medicine societies, the medicine, the psychiatric. Everyone's duplicitous in this thing. It's unbelievable when you really. You're going to love the fact that there is a re, a TV show that is doing that exact same thing. I'm going to show it to you at the break. All right, cool. thank you guys, and we'll see you all next time. Well, we're so pleased to have Hydrolyte back. Hydrolyte is something that. We and my family use just about every day, and it is simply the best oral rehydration product I have ever seen. And there are many reasons you should keep some around. I got the flu. I relied on Hydrolyte because I knew it would rehydrate me the way an IV fluid would. We all have heard about the flus and the diarrheas, and they all knock you out. Staying well hydrated is critical to getting over these conditions. Even if you manage to avoid getting infected, your schedule is half as busy as mine. Getting eight glasses of water a day isn't likely to happen. And you don't need it if you've got the proper hydration product, Hydrolyte. That is the beauty. Whether you're sick or not, you can absolutely benefit from proper balance of sodium, glucose, and water. Hydrolyte does this better than a sports drink or water alone. That's right, better. It comes in great flavors like orange, berry, lemonade. It's available in a pre-mixed powder. Of my personal preference, the little effervescent tablets you can simply drop in a bottle of water or a glass of water, and you're done. You got it, and you are rehydrated. And compared to sports drinks, Hydrolyte delivers up to four times the electrolytes with 75% less sugar. I know. Don't buy into the hype of the brands. Use Hydrolyte. It's a better product. I'm telling you, I had intended to invent it. They got there first, so I'm all behind them. Hydrolyte solutions are appropriate for all ages, and each bottle or package includes easy-to-follow dosing instructions. Order Hydrolyte today, hydrolyte.com slash drdrew. That is hydrolyte.com slash drdrew. And for a limited time, our listeners can save 30% on Hydrolyte. We actually buy in bulk in our family. So we're going to click through. Believe me, just click the banner on my site and use the code DrDrew18. That is D-R-D-R-E-W-18. Remember, you can find all these podcasts at drdrew.com. The Dr. Drew podcast, the This Life podcast, and the Adam and Drew podcast, which is available five days a week. Find them all on iTunes and rate us five stars. Subscribe and get it first. And if you're really happy, click on the Amazon banner at drdrew.com to help support the show. We'll thank you for it. If you join the email list via drdrew.com slash contact, we'll send you a weekly infusion newsletter with Dr. Drew's news. We're so grateful when you get in touch. We read all your emails and we'll bring you the subject matter you want to hear about. You live.